In this video, we want to use patterns to remember trig function derivatives. In other words, we want to remember this chart here, which might seem a daunting task or perhaps a tedious task. But if we find some patterns, we'll see that there is much less here, as it were, than meets the eye. So the first thing we want to do is to put this list in a better order. So we're going to put co-functions on the same line, so for example sine and cosine, and we'll write out all of the function names, for example tangent and cotangent, to make this connection clear. All right, so you see that these names are the same as these, just these have co in them. And we already can begin to suspect the existence of some patterns. For example, this here looks like the exact same thing as this here, except for the minus sign. And this has two members in it, and this also has two members. So let's take a closer look at the list in this order. We'll talk about ten patterns that will make this list be so clear that it will be difficult not to remember the list. So first thing, pattern number one, minus signs and co. A function's derivative begins with a minus signs if and only if the function's name contains co. So we see that here. All of these have a minus sign and all of these have co. And none of these have a minus sign and none of these have co. Pattern number two, swapping co-functions. So trig functions appearing in a derivative are the co-functions of those appearing in the co-functions derivative. In other words, if we're talking about the derivative of secant or the derivative of cosecant, then we see this relationship. The derivative of secant contains secant and tangent. The derivative of cosecant contains cosecant and cotangent, and that is true for all the members of this list. For example, again, we see here cosine, and here is sine. Pattern number three, swapping signs. So derivatives of co-functions inverses differ only by a sign. So we knew before that all of those involving uh, co have a minus sign, but for the bottom half of our list that is indeed the only difference, right? This is exactly the same as this. Right? The only difference between the derivatives of co-functions inverses is a sign. So if we use the patterns that we've used up until now, then we can have the memory load. We can d derive the right side of our list, for example, from the left side. This is the left side. We simply add a minus sign and replace each trig function with its co-function. So for example, if I wanted to know the derivative of cosecant, then I could use the patterns we've had up until now, that's a C here, to derive it. So first thing we, we know, since this is a cosecant, we know we must have a negative sign. And instead of uh, secant here, we would have to take cosecant. And then instead of tangent here, we would just have to take cotangent. And that would be it. In other words, we can derive one side of our list from the other. The bottom half, of course, being very easy, we only have to change the sign. But there are more patterns. There are, for example, self-contained regions. So let's look at the top half of our list here, the one that has all these trig functions in it. And we'll divide that up into three regions. We have a top region, a left region, and a right region. So the top region contains only sine and cosine. The left region uses only secant and tangent. And the right region uses only cosecant and cotangent. So for example, if you remembered the order of this list, and you wrote down sine and secant and tangent, and then you wondered, hmm, what is the derivative of secant? Well, you know that it can only have secant and tangent in it because it's in this region. 
And then you think, oh, that's right, that's the one that was secant of x, tangent of x. And these side regions actually have an additional pattern. If we write out this square here, in other words, we write, instead of secant squared of x, we write out secant of x, secant of x. And if we leave off all these other symbols here, we just ignore those, then we can write this whole region here as sec sec tan, right? That's sec sec tan. And here we have tan sec sec tan sec which is a simple symmetrical pattern that can be easily memorized. Pattern number six, derivatives of inverses look like inverses. So these are the inverse functions, right? The arc functions are the inverse functions, and they are all written as inverses, that is, one over something. They're multiplicative inverses, but they are inverses none the same. And this is actually not a coincidence, but is a consequence of the way that these are proved. This previous uh, pattern that we talked about was actually more of a coincidence because this derivative here for example or let's take uh, secant squared of x instead of writing secant squared of x I could also write 1 over cosine squared of x right it would be the same thing but then we would be using cosine which is something out of the region so the last one was more of a coincidence but a very convenient and helpful coincidence this one the fact that these are all written as inverses is not a coincidence, but is actually a consequence of this here, which is just the uh, rule for computing the derivative of a function's inverse. We'll talk about that in the next video when we'll prove all of these. Okay, so the next pattern, pattern number seven, derivatives of inverses never cross zero. If you look at each term involved in the denominators here, you see that they're all positive. Right. We either have squares, or positive numbers, or absolute values, or square roots. Everything's positive. So whatever I put into to these uh, functions here, I will always get a positive value. And the same thing goes here for the negative side. I will always get a negative value. And that can help us remember, for example, that we are indeed dealing with an absolute value here, and not just an x. Because if we had an x in there, then for a negative x, this would be a negative value and not positive one. So remember that all of these here on the left side do indeed give positive values and all on the right give negative values. Pattern number eight is something involving all of these squareds and ones. So if we look at the bottom half of our list again we see there are always x squareds and ones and maybe a minus sign or a plus sign. What's going on with that? This is another pattern that is actually a result of the way these are proved and not a coincidence. So let's look at this. There are four different ways we could write x squared and 1 with plus and minus. We could say x squared plus 1, x squared minus 1, negative x squared plus 1, or negative x squared minus 1. But only three of these can actually yield positive values. That is, only three of these could be the length of a side of a triangle. This one always gives us a positive value, right, since this is a square. This gives us a positive value for x values that are greater than 1. This one gives us a positive value for x values that are less than 1, or in both cases I should say the absolute value of x is less than 1, and here it's greater than 1. But this one can never give us a positive value. So let's cross that one out. And it is exactly these three that we encounter in our derivatives, written perhaps in a slightly different way. Next pattern, pattern number nine, comparing the domains. So since we can't divide by zero, and we can't take the square root of a negative number, each one of these derivatives here has a certain natural domain. So what would we have to put in here? We would have to put in something with an absolute value less than 1 in order not to have either a 0 in the denominator or something neg negative in the radical, right? So the domain just of this fraction, looking at it as a function, is this. 
So if we remembered that one of these derivatives, oh, one of these derivatives is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. I remember that, but I don't remember which one of these functions it fits to. We just have to look at the domains of the functions themselves. The, de the domain of arcsine fits very well to this domain here. And indeed, this is the derivative of arcsine. The same goes for the others. The only way that I can get this not to be a negative number is to take a number out of this set here, which is basically the same as this here. So there's only one way for these derivatives to be matched up with their respective functions. You might have noticed that we have here a closed interval, and here we have an open interval. And that is just an indication of the fact that this derivative is not defined everywhere. But, like I said, there's only one way for these to match up. Pattern number 10, comparing forms. The general form of each trig function's derivative is mirrored in the denominator of its inverse function's derivative. And what I mean by that is, if we look at the top half of the list, we have one thing in the derivative, here we have two things in the derivative, and here we have something squared. If we look at the bottom half of the list, we have one thing in the denominator, two things in the denominator, and then something in the denominator that is not squared, whereas these were. This is also not a coincidence, uh, but is again a consequence of this formula here for finding the uh, derivative of functions inverse. And we'll talk about that more in the next video when we'll prove all of these. So it's important to keep the whole picture in mind. You need to know the uh, ranges and domains of these functions if you are not just going to memorize them but actually use them. But remember that the range of the sine, cosine, secant, etc. functions of these trigonometric functions is exactly the same as the domain of the inverse function. Because if for example, I put something into the sine function and it spits out a some value between negative 1 and 1, then I want to be able to put that value in, that value between negative 1 and 1, and get some value out. Now the certain amount of arbitrariness involved here is dealing with the ranges of these inverse functions, of course. Since sine goes on forever and ever and ever and ever, and I want to know what the value was for, it's for some specific point like right here then I'm not going to be able to say whether that was from here or here or here or where right so I have to agree on some range and everyone basically agrees on the range for sine for cosine and for tangent but the problem comes in with the ranges for the other three secant cosecant and cotangent there's not universal agreement on these. These are the ones that we've used here for, for this video. And these actually do play a role in what derivatives you get. So this absolute value sign, for example, here, some people, some institutions, some books, have an x here instead of an absolute value of x because they send these values to a different range. But that's a topic for the next video where we will prove all of these results. For now, we have used a bunch of patterns to see that this chart here contains much less than meets the eye.